Good afternoon. I um, hope everyone has enjoyed uh, the lunch and is enjoying sunny Sheffield. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Julia O'Connor to the Social Policy Association annual conference today. Julia is a professor of social policy and also a member of the Institute for Research in Social Sciences at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. And she's going to be discussing gender equality in challenging times today. I talk, I'm certainly very much looking forward to you. Um, Julia will be familiar to many of you through her involvement in a number of sociology and social policy associations in England, Ireland, Europe, America, and Canada, as well as her influential academic work. Julia has focused on social inequality in various forms for the last 25 years or so and published extensively in the UK and beyond, with a particular interest in OECD and EU countries. Um, Julie, Julie is going to talk for about 40 minutes or so and then we'll have some time for questions. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to, to Julia. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for uh, inviting me to give this uh, address. I'm very honoured indeed uh, to do so. And I'm very impressed with that with forsaken the fine weather. It's obviously an indication that everybody probably believes we're going to have a wonderful summer, so we don't have to, uh, to take advantage of the one day we have. Anyhow, uh, I'm going to, to um, as we said, I'll, I'll talk for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes. And um, I, I should first point out that. Um, in looking at gender equality, I have taken a rather longer view of challenging times uh, than uh, some other people are at the contemporary period because what I want to do in the paper is to look at uh, positive developments and how they have been cut back and, uh, and, and the variation uh, cross nationally. As you can see, I'm focusing on. EU and uh, OECD countries, but I should emphasize that I'm only focusing on those uh, core OECD uh, countries, which is a not a great uh, term, but I'm, I'm talking about the OECD countries that were uh, that have been long time members of the, uh, the OECD. So the 18 that are often the, the work traditionally used in comparative analysis, and uh, so of course there's a lot of, of uh, uh, Crossover between the EU and the OECD, but basically, I wanted to, to have a look at uh, some of the developments in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, um, in addition uh, to the EU. So, the transformation of uh, gender relations and key factors contributing to changes in these uh, relations over recent decades in the EU and these core OECD countries are associated with two types of policies. First of all, we have um, some of the changes are, are associated with policies that have an explicit uh, gender equality focus or an explicit gender focus. In particular, policies relating to gender discrimination, um, body rights, gender-based violence, representation in decision-making, and reconciliation of employment and caring demands. But at a broad, broader level, uh, strategies and policies without a gender equality focus may have profound impacts on gender relations, such as child poverty measures, um, education, housing, public transport, and most of all, uh, labour market and, of course, migration policy. So, the in this paper, I address selected changes with respect to elements of both types of policy. But I have to emphasize that it is selective because I'm taking a rather broad view, uh, a broad overview of uh, uh, developments. So the uh, discussion is anchored on the one hand by labor market uh, change, in particular the policy objective to increase the labor market participation of women. And on the other hand, changes in decision-making machinery related to gender equality. So I look at uh, gender equality uh, agencies and structures and how they have progressed over time. 
So these two domains uh, afford a lens through which progress and barriers to transformation of public policy in a gender equality direction can be identified. So I consider transformation two cents. First, transformation of, wealth, of welfare states is reflected in approaches to labour market participation and uh, the rationale for their adoption by the whole OECD countries since, since the 1970s. And with a particular focus on gender equality objectives and their implications. And the second transformation is related to the growth and, in some cases, the demise of gender equality machinery and the role of gender mainstreaming as a mechanism for the transformation of gender relations. So that's why I'm taking this, this longer uh, view. The concluding section uh, acknowledges the significant changes in gender relations over the past several decades and considers to what extent we can characterize uh, contemporary states in the uh, EU and the OECD as gender equality states. And that harks back to, uh, to a work that was done for 25 years ago by, by Helga Hearns when she talked about women uh, uh, friendly states, but in fact uh, her focus was, was, uh, was broader, it was more a, a gender focus than just been narrowly focusing on women. So, um, okay, uh, the first part of the paper uh, focuses on some uh, conceptual issues, and I'm looking at uh, the change from the early focus on, on women's uh, policies to gender analysis and um, when I'm distinguishing between these various concepts of gender awareness, gender sensitive analysis, studies of gender that, concept, that contest gender hierarchies and the move to or uh, move or not to uh, gender equality. So the concern of gender-sensitive analysis is which how gender is involved in processes and structures that previously have been conceived as having nothing to do with gender. And that's a quote from, uh, from Jonah Acker. And uh, gender differences are widely identified in contemporary analysis. In, in other words, there's a lot of gender awareness in uh, contemporary analysis and in contemporary uh, policy discourse. But this is very different from uh, gender analysis in feminist scholarship, which Anna Orlok has identified as, and I quote, studies of gender that contest gender hierarchies, end quote. And I focus it on the, uh, the differences uh, between these uh, throughout the paper. So I will also be talking uh, a bit about the preferred policy regimes, and uh, I'm uh, certainly aware of the uh, the extensive debates on uh, the welfare state regime uh, concept, and I'm taking uh, putting those in the in, in the background. But I still think the concept of policy regimes is uh, is is useful, and in as you know, there was an extensive debate on. Uh, welfare state regimes and extensive critique by feminist analysts uh, following the Esping Anderson uh, uh, contribution. And uh, I'm not going to go into those critiques. That I suffice to say, is, uh, say that uh, Jane Lewis, uh, the, uh, the major and very influential uh, contribution to this debate when she spoke about uh, the main uh, breadwinner uh, policy regime. And, and of course, some of her work talked about the move from the main breadwinner uh, to the adult worker family uh, model in, in some uh, EU and OECD countries. And uh, I was arguing and I hope to demonstrate in table one that uh, we have now, in some countries, moved on to varieties of new learner uh, So. What I have uh, done in this uh, table is to um, to um, 
to look at uh, 14 uh, OECD countries, several of which, of course, are uh, EU countries as well, and to categorize them uh, by uh, uh, policy regimes, uh, clusters. So you have the social democratic, uh, the conservative, the, the, the liberal, and the uh, southern regime. Uh, uh, I told that the, uh, the slide on the far side is much clearer than this one, but I hope that you can see this from the back. Um, um, uh, but, um, so, to, just to speak uh, to this uh, table, in the late uh, 20th century there was a shift in several economically developed countries from the main weather and family model to the one and a half earner uh, family and in some instances the Lewis identified Sweden and the United States to an adult worker family. Uh, which is assumed, where it is assumed that all adult workers are in the labour market. And uh, you will see from uh, this uh, table that the social democratic cluster, which is the Denmark, uh, Norway, uh, at, the, uh, at the top, uh, demonstrates the highest levels of participation from 1990 onwards, having experienced a significant uh, increase in labour force participation between 1960 and 1990. And a broadly similar pattern is evident in the Liberal cluster, uh, you will see uh, it there, where I have uh, included uh, UK, Ireland, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And um, although I should say that when I say that a broadly similar pattern uh, it was uh, evident in the Liberal cluster, uh, that is with the uh, exception of Ireland, but the change was much uh, uh, later, but, uh, but certainly uh, caught up. And Germany and Spain also experienced the greatest change in the uh, post 1990 period, and this reflects major increases in female part time employment, particularly in Germany. And uh, this uh, part time and quality is also particularly high in uh, uh, Italy and uh, Ireland. In contrast, the percentage of women in part time work decreased from 1990 uh, to 2010 uh, in the social democratic cluster and the liberal cluster, with the exception of Ireland. In 2010, both the United States and Sweden had less than 20% of the female labour force uh, in part time work. In 2010, uh, part-time work as a proportion of total employment was less than 39% in countries being included in Table 1, excluding the, the Netherlands, which of course has this exceptionally high level of, uh, of part-time work. Even of course, when we talk about the Netherlands, we have to uh, bear in mind that their cut off for uh, part-time work is in fact uh, very high, it's 35 hours per week. So, so much of what they consider part-time would be considered almost full-time in, in other uh, countries. So in its gender brief uh, in 2010, the OECD concluded that the dual ownership model has become the norm, and that's uh, their word, in the majority of OECD countries. But this reflects a very mixed uh, picture, I would say. Based on 207 data, at least 50% of couple families with children aged 0 to 14 in uh, 13 of these core OECD countries um, were characterized by uh, full time dual ownership. These are Finland, uh, Portugal, and the 204. Uh, Eastern European EU accession countries, except uh, Hungary and the Czech Republic. The increase in full time equivalent employment, which I think is the really interesting column, in this, which is the last column in this uh, table, and the increase in the full time equivalent employment reflects a uh, change in. Uh, policy orientation in several uh, countries and is in line with the prescription of the EU and the OECD 
who has had a policy emphasis on increasing the employment rate for women over the past several decades. And the full term equivalent uh, rates are calculated by multiplying the employment population ratio by average weekly hours worked by all employees and dividing by four kids. And for males, the full time um, equivalent, uh, I'm only just giving the rates for females here, uh, range from 71 to 73% for all of the EU countries in 2010, except for France, where it was 67%, and Ireland, 64%. Even though the Irish figure reflects the uh, impact of the severe uh, uh, recession there, in fact, it was uh, higher and close uh, to the uh, EU average. Uh, so we have this uh, full time equivalent rate uh, for, for women being uh, ranging from uh, 64% uh, to uh, 56%. Except in the, uh, you see, in the southern cluster, uh, Italy and Spain have still a very low uh, full time equivalent rate, and Portugal uh, has traditionally had a high uh, female uh, labour force in their participation rate. However, there is increasing recognition uh, by organisations uh, such as the EU and the OECD. Despite the numerous improvements uh, in women's educational and employment outcomes, many countries have not achieved gender equality in economic opportunities and outcomes. And this has been the impetus for uh, a 2011 OECD Gender Initiative, uh, which is directed to addressing gender equality in education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And similarly, uh, the EU despite numerous uh, targeted uh, gender initiatives over the past uh, two decades uh, for the need to uh, issue a women's charter in 2010, committed to strengthening gender equality in all of its uh, policies. So before examining the links with specific gender strategies as reflected in policy machinery, I want to look first at the uh, differential employment experiences, not only by gender, but by education over time. And uh, I think this, uh, the differences we find when we, uh, when we look at uh, the experiences of both men and women uh, by educational level can be uh, very significant and very stark in terms of uh, uh, the policy implications. Uh, so, uh, just to uh, just as a background, um, as you know, the EU has very strong uh, uh, commitment uh, to high levels of employment, and uh, and of course, from the very beginning, uh, there was uh, an emphasis on uh, high levels of, of employment, and this was uh, was uh, we acted on uh, in a coherent way uh, by the uh, European Employment Strategy dating from 1997 and, and then of course the Lisbon object, Lisbon uh, strategy uh, laid out key objectives in relation to employment and uh, two of which I mentioned here, the, the objective of increasing total employment employment rate from uh, just over 60% to 70% by 2010, and increasing the female employment rate from 51 to 60% by uh, 2010. And so what, what we have here is, in this table is employment rates by sex and highest level of education in the EU 27, uh, in 2000, 2007, and 2010. So we do see some increase over time, and but the message, I, what I want to, to look at particularly are at the, the 2010 uh, figures. So I, I hope people uh, at the back can figure, no, they can't figure this out. Okay, so what I've done here is the first section looks at, I, I speak to, through it because I, I can appreciate that people can't uh, figure it out if they're in the uh, back. Is I look first at all educational levels, and then the second, uh, the third set of columns uh, looks at the situation up to lower second level. 
then uh, I go on to look at upper secondary, post secondary, non tertiary, and then uh, first and second level tertiary education. And the message clearly from this uh, table is that we have a significant uh, difference both in terms of uh, employment rates and in the unemployment rate and in the percentage of low wage earners, one might expect, as one goes up the educational um, level. And this is true for both men and women. So, for example, if um, I just have a summary. Yeah, by 2010, the employment rate targets set out by the Lisbon strategy, that's the 70% for men and the 60% for women, were exceeded for people with higher levels of education in all of the EU 27 countries. So we had those uh, targets exceeded. Uh, the EU 27 employment rates for those with first and second stage tertiary education were 82% in 2010. And range uh, and were high actually for all of the previous uh, decade. And um, the corresponding figure for uh, for women was 79 percent in 2010, and uh, and this was slightly higher for the previous decade. The only countries with less than 75 percent employment rate for people at the higher levels of education were Greece, Spain, the Czech. Public in Slovenia, and even here for this higher level of uh, education group, uh, the employment rate for women was 70% or uh, 70%. These, uh, the data in this uh, table are noteworthy not only for the high employment rates for people with the highest levels of education, but the marked differences between the three levels of education. And the consistency from 2002 to 2010, I mean, with an increase from 2007 to 2010, reflecting uh, the recession. So, concentrating first in one rates for 2010 for the 20 to 64 age group, we find that the total employment rates for those with upper secondary and post secondary level education, which was just at the uh, 2010 target level was 12.5% lower than those with tertiary education. So that we have 12.5% lower than those who go to second level education. But it was 16.5% higher for those uh, those with uh, the, uh, the up to lower second level education. So if we take the gap between those at the um, the lowest level education and at the tertiary level, we have we have a 29 percent gap, and it seems to I think this is highly significant because it seems to me that this is is not sufficiently addressed in the policy prescription either at the EU or at, at national uh, level, and there is a growing body of uh, of, of research. Uh, by uh, people like Bea Cantlon and uh, other colleagues of hers, uh, who uh, are, are pointing out that, that many of the, the very positive uh, measures in terms of, of gender equality are just not uh, benefiting, unfortunately, this, uh, this lower educated uh, group. And uh, so, Okay, so to move on, the Europe 2020, which is the latest uh, uh, strategy uh, which replaced uh, the Lisbon strategy and it set out the strategy for the period from 2011 to 2020. So it has set uh, the 2020 employment target uh, at 75% for men and women. 75% uh, total, and, and countries have individual member states by identified targets ranging from a low of 63% in Malta to well over 80% in Sweden. The majority of countries setting it, setting on around the 75% or above level. 
but it's increasingly acknowledged that meeting these quantitative targets will be difficult. It is even more questionable that these targets can be met while improving the quality of work and working conditions, which is one of the priorities of Europe 2020 uh, jobs agenda. And of course, the uh, poor quality uh, employment is very much it's disproportionately affected at the lower level. So, setting the Europe 2020 employment targets in the context of Table 2, it is obvious that the real labour market challenge is to meet the employment needs of those with the lowest educational levels, who are less likely to be in employment and win employment when in the labour market are more likely to be unemployed irrespective of economic conditions. So, for this group, uh, there was um, an unemployment rate of uh, almost 12% in 2002 and it was 16% uh, in 2010 compared to, uh, if we take the uh, first and second level tertiary education group, we talk about less than 5% in 2002 and 5.5% in 2010. So really education is, is, is crucial in this, uh, uh, this consideration of employment measures. So these individuals at the lower educational uh, level are more likely to be targeting jobs in the uh, middle and lower levels of the occupational spectrum in terms of skill. And given the persistence of substantial, of substantial percentage of poor quality employment, and we have quite a good deal of uh, information now from the EU in terms of quality employment, uh, quality of uh, employment. Um, so, as I, as I was saying, given the pers uh, persistence of substantial percentages of poor quality employment, increasing labour market polarisation, the challenge of meeting the EU 2020 target in terms of uh, quality is indeed uh, severe. Started out as focusing exclusively on women, uh, but uh, informed by a strong uh, gender uh, gender analysis. The approach adopted varied in line with the political, social, and cultural background, and it some, in particular, the northern countries reflect the recognition of gender equality as part of a broader equality agenda. The Nordic approach in the present an extensive institutional gender equality structure and uh, gender equality is an integral part of the broader public policy framework uh, reflecting the structural understanding of uh, equality and was in place not only earlier than other welfare state justice but its integrity has been maintained to a greater extent than is the case in several liberal welfare states, which went through a period of, of great celebration about the effectiveness of their uh, uh, gender uh, equality uh, agencies and structures. And I, in the paper, I mentioned in particular uh, Australia and, and Canada. And it with some um, Sadness that one looks at, at these two cases because while they were in the vanguard in introducing uh, strong uh, gender equality uh, agencies, 
during the 1970s and 80s, they were also in the vanguard of um, decapitating them and, uh, in the uh, late 90s and uh, 2000s. And um, so to, to summarize, uh, what happened was, of course, that they enjoyed this, this uh, great success in establishing these, these agencies uh, due in Australia to the uh, coming into power of the, uh, the Australian uh, uh, Labour Party at the time, you know, strong uh, women's movement. So uh, there was a, a very favourable opportunity structure and uh, the, uh, the appropriate uh, political configuration at the time was conducive to the development of this very strong uh, gender equality uh, structure. And uh, so you had, for example, things like the women's budget uh, at, at a very early stage in, in, in Australia, of course, that's where the, the term femocrats came from. So you had the, the, uh, the women in the uh, uh, public sector being, being quite influential. And you had somewhat similar but, but less was less entrenched uh, situation in Canada. But both uh, were, have been severely cut back by the uh, coming into power of, uh, by the street has a, has a Labour Party that is in power at the minute. We've been hearing about the Duke uh, Edgiller and her demise uh, there. But uh, this has been in power for a very short period, and in fact, the, uh, the Liberal Party had, in fact, explicitly campaigned on the idea of getting rid of these equality structures and saw uh, a gender equality and women in particular as a special interest to campaign of that and acted on its campaign promises with the government part. And similarly, the Conservative Party in Canada cut back uh, enormously the, uh, the gender equality structures that were in place there. So what those uh, two cases illustrate very clearly is uh, the importance of the uh, political opportunity uh, structure and the uh, importance of politics in uh, terms of gender equality. And of course, the uh, Fawcett Society in the UK and the UK Women's Budget uh, who have, have over the past a couple of years made similar arguments in relation to the uh, and the, the uh, undermining of, of uh, gender equality uh, agencies. And indeed, we had similar groups in the US with the, the, the sort of positive groups in Clinton after Bush. Uh, then then uh, we had the um, and between uh, the, the Bush and, and, and Obama, oh, sorry, I should phrase that, phrase that incorrectly, Clinton to, to Bush and then, then to Obama, you certainly had, had changes in, in terms of equality structures and agencies. So um, there is considerable intra-regime, to summarize, there is considerable intra-regime variation in gender equality structures uh, in, in several of the uh, Regime clusters, and that's particularly evident in the, in the southern cluster where you have Italy at one end of the, of the, of the spectrum and you have Spain at the other end. Which uh, though would be interesting to see how Spain would fare now with the present uh, economic uh, economic trials uh, that it's, it's undergoing. But certainly, uh, while the uh, Socialist Party were in part of the fact, a very explicit. Uh, uh, <coughs> Effort to enhance uh, gender equality, and uh, and that was of course um, in a period as well when you had a very high representation of uh, of women in parliament, and in fact in the uh, cabinet, fifty percent representation of women in cabinet under the Socialist Party in Spain. So. Um, about seven minutes. Okay, so I, I uh, will come to that back during the, the discussion. I want to move on uh, to the, uh, the, the gender uh, 
it's really the main point that we've made there you know, is the influence of political parties, the opportunities are, are uh, key. But two significant developments over the past couple of decades have uh, changed the context within which women equality agencies are working and are operating. And these are the implementation of gender mainstreaming and the recent growth of civil equality agencies. So, of course, gender mainstreaming is strongly associated with the uh, 1995 uh, 4UN uh, World uh, Conference of Beijing, and uh, where it called for a shifted focus from women to the concept of, of gender, recognizing that the entire structure of society and relation, relations within, within it had to be reevaluated. And it calls for the adoption of gender mainstream, that is, and again, I quote, the process of assessing the implications for women and men of any planned action, including legislation, policies, and programs in all areas and at all levels. And the EU actually made a formal commitment to gender mainstreaming in 1997 and had contributed uh, quite a bit uh, to the UN uh, uh, development of gender mainstreaming. So, gender mainstreaming is, implies a transformative strategy going beyond gender awareness to an analysis of the structural basis of gender inequality. But despite its radical potential, there is little evidence of rigorous conceptualization and application of gender mainstreaming in the EU. Its transformative potential cannot be realized without the full complement of the necessary instruments that allow for the measurement of gender impact and its transparent uh, demonstration. Okay, so uh, I point out very strongly that if you don't have effective and open and transparent gender impact assessment and gender budgetary analysis, uh, one uh, really does uh, limit the radical potential of, of, of gender mainstreaming. And based on the analysis of 30 Euro European countries, including the EU27, the expert group on gender equality, social inclusion, health, and long term care concluded in 2010. Though most countries have developed initiatives to promote gender equality, a systematic and comprehensive approach for active inclusion policies is generally lacking, and actual implementation is often underdeveloped. Moreover, the attention paid to gender mainstreaming may be sensitive to political changes resulting in a lack of consistency, and they provide considerable evidence to, uh, through uh, country reports to uh, substantiate uh, that conclusion. And this is indeed uh, consistent with other analyses and critiques uh, of uh, gender mainstreaming in the EU and uh, elsewhere. So, um, the distinctly modest and lean development of gender mainstreaming is of major significance, not only because of the traditional uh, reasons for its, not only because the traditional reasons for its development are still present, but because the current crisis has brought to light significant changes in, in impacting and challenges impacting on men and women. These reinforce the need for gender impact assessment not only on gender equality grounds, but also to help identify uh, the likely broader social and economic consequences of labor market uh, trajectories. So to um, I move on quickly to complete and give time for uh, questions. So the, the issue I raise in the uh, conclusions is uh, you know, gender awareness to gender equality, question mark. And the point I make is that gender awareness uh, is pervasive now. It's, uh, and every policy uh, that's issued has, you know, has a, you know, will, will tend to give uh, uh, some uh, nod uh, to the importance of, of uh, gender. But I would argue that that, that often uh, doesn't uh, move on to actual 
uh, a gender analysis in the sense that would identify the structural basis of the uh, inequality. So while we've had significant transformation in uh, gender equality over the past several decades in poor OECD countries, uh, particularly in educational outcomes and employment participation, progress has not been uniform across dimensions of uh, equality, and full gender equality in economic opportunity and outcomes has not been achieved even in countries with overall substantial levels of progress, and of course, even uh, commentators would, uh, would, would certainly subscribe to that conclusion. The extent of change varies cross nationally, and the potential of gender equality measures is not equally achievable by all socioeconomic groups in any of these countries. The persistence of gender inequality and its negative economic consequences are drivers of recent additional EU and OECD gender equality initiatives, and I referred to those earlier. Taking these facts into account, we cannot conclude that poor OECD countries are gender equality states in the sense used by, uh, by Helga Hearns uh, over a quarter of a century when she was uh, referring to the uh, Nordic uh, countries. That is states that do not force force harder choices on women than on men, have eliminated all unjust treatment on the basis of sex, and in particular have addressed other forms of inequality, such as among groups of women. That's summarizing her uh, position. Yet, poor OECD states have been transformed in relation to gender equality as reflected in anti-discrimination legislation and former processes of gender equality and some far more so than others. All these states can be characterized as gender equality awareness states. The failure to situate gender inequality within the framework of broader structural inequalities means that the other forms of inequality, such as among groups of women, have not been addressed. This is most obvious in terms of socioeconomic differences as uh, illustrated in the labor market patterns uh, that I uh, referred to earlier. These other forms of inequality are the focus of intersectionality analysis, or some of these other forms of inequality are the focus of intersectionality analysis, and their recognition underlies strategies on multiple discrimination, which have changed the context within which gender equality is being framed. And this is reflected in the creation of single equality bodies in several countries. And this is the direction that, uh, that the uh, EU uh, is uh, putting forward uh, since the Amsterdam Treaty when it identified sex, race, ethnicity, religion, age, disability, and sexuality as grounds for uh, discrimination. To some extent, we can now speak of an equality awareness uh, state. Would this like gender equality awareness is constrained by the failure to address the structural basis of these inequalities and to examine their intersection as opposed to uh, merely juxtaposing them as Lombard and Bernoulli. So a key conclusion of this analysis is that politics matter in terms of developing gender equality structures and while welfare regime clusters are uh, important, they are not uh, determining. We find considerable inter regime uh, uh, differences. Individual state choices relating to gender equality reflect the historical mobilization of political and economic forces. The historical policy choices made and the policy legacy stemming from these choices. In the contemporary period, the constellation of influences has broadened to a capacity to really intensify global pressures, but supranational regional, super, supranational regional differences such as the EU and more broadly forces of institutions such as the OECD, the ILO, and the UN. And I would argue that these agencies are exceedingly uh, important in terms of, of uh, awareness, so that member states are really the center of gravity if we uh, need action. While states have enhanced capacity to address gender inequality as reflected in gender equality agencies and gender mainstreaming, and 
demonstrate a high level of gender awareness, a level of conformity to the requirements of commitments is relatively weak in most countries. This is re repeatedly demonstrated in the periodic reviews of, uh, of practice in signatory countries of the, the UN Convention on the Elimination of Forms of Discrimination, uh, Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW uh, Convention, and the EU Directives and Commitments. So to come to reflecting on the process of change in gender relations over the past few decades, the role of the state has been pervasive and in some times and in some locations dominant, but at all times governed by the dominant political orientation, including the gender representativeness of parliaments and the pressures, pressure or its absence from civil society sources, in particular quality oriented uh, women's movements and counter equality uh, movements. These factors explain to a significant, uh, significant extent the variation in the institutionalization of equality structures and equality outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a few minutes for questions. We've not got very long. Um, we can take questions in threes. And if you could um, state your name and where you come from as well, please, folks. So, have we got any, any questions? We've got one here. Please tell you the University of Kent. Thanks very much for summarising major elements of recent history in 40 minutes. Uh, but, uh, Question, would it have been reasonable to contract this, to contract this, into saying that there has actually been real progress in gender equality to a considerable extent with variations? But that should have taken place in the context of a retrograde movement in terms of income inequalities, to put it crudely, over time, with all sorts of natural variations across Europe. So the question is, how do you tie those together, and is there a move to gender equality plus, which would actually be some real human equality, and possibly a move in the direction of greater human welfare? Any more questions? No, okay, well, I agree perfectly with, you, with your sentiments, and, and I think that's what comes out from this, uh, these critiques uh, that are uh, certainly people like Bea Cantlin and, and her colleagues uh, are, are making. And there, you know, there's this debate going on now of the, the social and the investment uh, approach and critiques of it, and, and really arguing that, okay, it's a very positive approach, but it is not addressing these, uh, uh, these people. At, uh, it's not addressing the social class issues because it doesn't look at the underlying structure at the basis of the, of the inequality. So where some uh, women are rightly benefiting greatly uh, from, from this, or some families rather, because it's the dual learner that families that are, that are benefiting greatly and because of our homogamy Learner that obviously is well educated, and uh, we have the less well known. And uh, that would be my, my, my major critique, and that's where we need to, to, to push the bandwidth. Any more questions? Okay, I'll ask one then. <laughs> um, I, was, I was interested when you were talking about. Um, levels of employment. A lot of my research focuses on older women um, and basically I was interested in what kind of differences you were seeing in terms of the employment levels amongst younger and older women in the countries you look at. Well there, there are uh, a sharp age in, uh, sure. uh, there are marked age differences and more marked in some, uh, some uh, uh, the labour participation strategy for both women starts to be higher earlier in, in, the, in the Nordic countries and, and in countries where it starts late, you have some short, hard time work by uh, older, older women and, and of course that is an impact on their, their earning potential and on their, their security in old age. So it has a very consequence. <coughs> I think there's some, some really interesting 
of issues around active, active aging policies and extended working plans as pension agents go. Any more questions? No? Well, to be fair, we're just about at the coffee break anyway, so it's so pretty good timing. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you ever so much for coming here and presenting to us. Thank you.